On behalf of the African trustee for the African BBT, His Holiness Jayad Veta Swami, we'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you. A special welcome to Mr. Luvoyo Mandela, the grandson of the world icon and the late President Mandela. Mr. Luvoyo is our special guest this evening, sir. We welcome representatives from the Kaida Rasmal Foundation, and representatives from the Tabo and Beki Foundation, and I would like to also acknowledge our international audience who are online on BBT Africa Live from cities across Africa, Belgium, the United States, India, and New Zealand. We are also privileged to gather to have a conversation around what freedom means on the eve of Human Rights Day, and to have your company and participation, we are grateful. This Bhaktivedanta Swami lecture is hosted by the African BBT, as you can see from the branding around you. You may know that the BBT operates from many capital cities of the world, from Stockholm, Mumbai, Beijing, Los Angeles, and is the world's leading publisher of books on Vedic philosophy. To place this quantum in perspective, a BBT book reaches the hands of someone on the planet every three seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, by the time we conclude our proceedings this evening, 3,600 BBT books would have gone through translation, editing, printing, and distribution in one of our major 4,500 languages in the world and will find its way into the heart of society. Of course, the BBT was founded by a very remarkable man, a very remarkable person in whose honor this lecture has been named. CNN voted him the, amongst the top 100 most successful persons in the century. I think it's just one position after Ronald Reagan. Actually, his success is described as one of the greatest spiritual events of the century. Yet, Bhaktivedanta Swami himself was a very humble man, a true servant of humanity and a revolutionary social reformer. This lecture is intended to introduce him to the world and the world to him. Today we are honored to hear from a direct student of Bhaktivedanta Swami, a graduate from the renowned Yale University in the United States of America, an author, an evangelist for spiritually based economics and sustainable living. His Holiness Devamri Swami is widely traveled, a very sought after speaker, who is not only an intellectual giant, but a seasoned practitioner. Most importantly, he is a living representative of the tradition that Bhaktivedanta Swami himself represented. You will agree that notwithstanding our race, gender, age, nationality, ethnicity, political persuasion, or even our theological perspective, we are all united in our quest for knowledge. Real knowledge must then be the mascot for real freedom. To an institution such as WITS, a leading research institute, university in the world, that admits 23,000 young fertile minds every year in the pursuit of knowledge, the topic of freedom must be a fitting one. And it seeks to add another dimension to human thought. So please join me in welcoming His Holiness Devamrita Swami Maharaj to the podium to deliver his keynote. The topic of freedom is one that resonates with all human beings. You can approach the concept of freedom from so many angles, political, economic, intellectual freedom, religious freedom, academic freedom, artistic freedom, and so on. People are enamored by freedom of movement, freedom of assembly. Whenever you hear that something is free, you get the sense that there are no boundaries, no limitations, free elections, free markets, free love, free thinking. Indeed, 
Many human beings long to be as free as a bird. If any of you are studying commerce and marketing, you know how marketers tap into the human love of freedom and things free. You go to a shop, a supermarket, a store, and what do you see? Buy two, get the third one free. Marketers know that you actually don't need two but you can't resist the temptation of getting something for free. So you rationalize to yourself, buy two, get the third one free. I only came to the store to get one, but who knows? I could store the other two or give the other two away. So my point is that there's something attractive about freedom and things that are free. Yet, we need to try to understand a much deeper and broader concept of freedom. I'm very much attracted to a statement by Nelson Mandela. There is no such thing as part freedom. But it is this part freedom that I say our economic and political leaders have been offering the world. We need to go much deeper. We need to have a broader understanding of freedom based not simply on materialism, but on the spiritual reality. Is divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, as Bhaktivedanta Swami is known in full, came to South Africa twice. He also went to Kenya. In Kenya, he exhorted the students, the general population, the leaders, that they should build their nation on the spiritual platform. What I'm going to propose to you tonight is that indeed, if we're going to actually have real progress, we need to consider the spiritual platform and then we can understand what is full freedom as contrasted to partial freedom. I'm going to touch upon a thirst that cannot be quenched by politics and economics. I'd like to introduce what is the most important human right that distinguishes us from the birds, the bees. After World War II, many nations of the world came together in the United Nations and approved of a universal declaration of human rights. The world was still traumatized by the horrors of World War II in which 55 million people died. The consciousness at that time was never again. Let us make this universal declaration of human rights and in that way a clear path forward for the progress of humanity can be cleared. I'm going to provoke you a little bit, please don't mind and I'll be happy to hear your response. There are five great myths of human progress. These myths have all turned out to be suspect. Myth number one, money brings happiness. Social scientists, through their research, have established that beyond a basic middle-class standard of living, any further increase in income or luxury does not lead to an increase in happiness as measured by objective psychological standards. I spoke about this a few years ago at University of Cape Town. 
an audience of 200 students and professors. I asked them, I'm sure you're familiar with the new science of happiness, about 20 years old. You're familiar with this research that beyond this middle class level of financial attainment. Any further increase in wealth will not make you any happy. I asked for a show of hands. 80% of those attending raised their hands saying, we have heard of this. It's generally accepted. Academics will quibble about details, but the general concept is accepted. So then I said, knowing this and knowing your level of intelligence and education, potential success, how many of you here are prepared to live your life on a basic middle class standard? No one raised their hands. So what we see is painful. What we see is a disconnect between knowledge and lifestyle. From the viewpoint of the ancient Vedic knowledge of India, and more precisely, I should say, associated with India, just like the sun is associated with the east, loosely speaking, we say the sun rises in the east. But the sun is for everyone. It's just as it's just that in the material world of temporary material manifestations, things have to have some connection to time and space. So therefore we say, this knowledge is associated with this place. That knowledge will tell us.